Good morning, my darlings, and welcome to day eight of the 31 Days of Horror. And today, my darlings, I bring you Terms. Yes, by Dean Poontz. A rollickingly good read this is. It doesn't let up from the minute you pick the book up. And it's not what you think. It's very H.P. Lovecraft in essence. And who doesn't love a little bit of H.P. Lovecraft and Cthulhu? Well, this, yeah. It's a homage. It is indeed a homage. And you will absolutely adore it. And there he is, Uncle Dean. Thank you, darling. What a treasure of a book. What an absolutely brilliant story. Not what you think. And it's who do you trust? Mm -hmm. Well, I wrote a few notes for you, my darlings. Uh, first published in 1983 by W.H. Allen and Company, PLC, and that was in Great Britain, and then reprinted in 1990 by Headline Books, publishing PLC. Yeah. We meet two sisters, Jennifer and Lisa Page, and they're going home to where Jennifer lives because Jennifer's a lot older than Lisa and she's also qualified as a doctor and they live in a wonderful mountain village in Snowfield that's it that's the name of the place and uh, Jennifer's become the doctor there and she's 31 now as Jennifer so she's a lot older than Lisa uh, Lisa was the, her younger sister, of course, um, born six months before her father passed away. And now recently, their mother has died and um, Lisa had no one to take care of her. So Jennifer stepped in and said, right, it's done. You're coming to live with me in Snowfield and we'll make the best of it. And this is where you'll go to school and this is where you'll live with me and absolutely fantastic so they have a new life together or so they thought it's at this point going back to snowfield that we meet the titular phantoms and our descent into madness Yes, our descent into madness begins at this point. You see, Jennifer has a housekeeper called Hilda. Uh, and when they arrive home and Lisa goes into the kitchen, she finds Hilda sprawled on the floor. Now, Jennifer comes running in to check her over thinking that she might have fallen, but no, this woman is stone cold, dead, deader than flares, man. Anyway, it's all, she's only been dead a couple of minutes, yet looking at the decomposition of the body, it looks as though she's been dead for weeks. Absolutely impossible, absolutely ludicrous. So what could have caused the death? Plague, germ warfare, a heart attack? Who knows? It's the look of horror that's on Hilda's face that makes her death seem all the more unusual. And of course, at this point, Lisa's completely freaking out and so's Jennifer. So, in order to get help, they decide to go to the Santoris who live next door. Yet, when they get to the Santoris next door, this is where the weirdness gets even, well, weirder, shall we say. Dinner is set out on the table. We would expect that. It is evening. There are no 
there's no one there, there's no body, there's no body, there's nothing, but there is a large body of water. Where did the water come from? And why is no one there? And why is the food still warm? It gets stranger and stranger, and they go off investigating house after house, and there's no one there. Suddenly, the church bells start ringing. But how can the church bells be ringing if there's no one there to pull the ropes? How very, very strange. Eventually, the girls manage to get to the police station and they're hoping at the police station that they can get a telephone line, a one that works, because every phone that they've tried so far, well, there's a dead nothing. There's just nothing there. So we eventually get to the police station. And this is where things get really, really bonkers because they can't see it and they can't feel it, but there is a presence and it is watching and waiting and it is ready to pounce. But the girls just feel like something is very, very wrong. Something evil is in town and something is waiting to get them. Will the girls find a phone line that works? Will the girls be able to call for help? Will somebody come and save them? Well, you're going to have to read the books, aren't you, my darling? Because I won't spoil the ending or the middle bit. I want you to really enjoy this book. I uh, read it, oh gosh, over the summer. Yeah, and uh, Dean doesn't disappoint. Do you, darling? Hmm? You do not disappoint. I've got to read you the uh, introduction. It is really good. All the pages are sticking together because it's quite an old book. Ha ha. Part one. Victims. Fear came upon me and trembling. The book of Job 4.14. The civilised human spirit cannot get rid of a feeling of the uncanny. Dr. Faustus Thomas Mann. The town jail. The scream was distant and brief. A woman's scream. Deputy Paul Henderson looked up from his copy of the time. He cocked his head, listening. Motes of dust drifted lazily in a bright shaft of sunlight that pierced one of the mullioned windows. The thin red second hand on the wall clock swept soundlessly around the dial. The only noise was the creak of Henderson's office chair as he shifted his weight in it. Through the large front windows, he could see a portion of Snowfield's main street, Skyline Road, which was perfectly still and peaceful in the golden afternoon sunlight. Only the trees moved, leaves a flutter in a soft wind. After listening intently for several seconds, Henderson was not sure he had actually heard anything. 
Imagination, he told himself. Just wishful thinking. He almost would have preferred that someone had screamed. He was restless. During the off-season from April through September, he was the only full-time sheriff's deputy assigned to the Snowfield substation. And the duty was dull. In the winter, when the town was to host several thousand skiers, there were drunks to be dealt with, fist fights to be broken up, and room burglaries to be investigated at the inns and the lodges and the motels where the skiers stayed. But now, in early September, only the Candle Glow Inn, one lodge and two small motels were open, and the natives were quiet, and Henderson who was just 24 years old and concluding his first year as a deputy was bored. Well, be bored no more, young man. He sighed, looked down at the magazine that lay on his desk and he heard another scream. <gasps> as before, it was distant and brief. But this time, it sounded like a man's voice and it wasn't merely a shriek of excitement or even a cry of alarm. It was the sound of terror. Frowning, Henderson got up and headed towards the door, adjusting the holstered revolver on his right hip. He stepped through the swinging gate in the railing that separated the public area from the bullpen and he was halfway to the door when he heard movement in the office behind him. That was impossible. He had been alone in the office all day and there hadn't been any prisoners in there for three holding cells since early last week. The rear door was locked and that was the only other way into the jail. When he turned, however, he discovered that he wasn't alone anymore. And suddenly he wasn't the least bit Bored. Does that not whet your appetite, my darlings? Does that not make you want to pick up this gorgeous book and delve deep into its pages and find out why Sheriff Henderson was no longer bored? Mm. A very, very juicy. Peace on now, my darlings. I've saved this one. I really like this one. And I'm sure you're going to love it too. The Santini family had escaped. And if Jacob and Ada had been spared, perhaps most of the town wasn't dead. Perhaps, perhaps. Perhaps. Oh God. On the other side of the piled cookware, in the middle of the butcher's block counter, lay a round, large mound of pie dough. Yes. A wooden rolling pin rested on the dough. Two hands gripped the ends of the rolling pin. Two severed hands. Where was the body? Mm. That's all I'm going to read you, my darlings. Two severed hands. Where are 
of the residence of Snowfield. Will anyone come and rescue Jennifer and Lisa? Let's hope they do. Let's hope the creeping, crawling, stalking presence doesn't find them before help does. My darling Joe, you're going to have to read the book to find out what happens. But you will not be bored like Sheriff Henderson. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, you're going to find out just exactly who, what lurks in the deepest, darkest shadows. And where and why these puddles of water have suddenly appeared and disappear. And why the bells toll with no one pulling the ropes. And why the fire station? Do the lights come on? And the emergency bells ring there too. All will be revealed when you read Phantoms. Now, I do believe this was made into a film not so long ago, and it starred a very, very young Ben Affleck. And if I'm not mistaken, Peter O'Toole was in it as well. So two very good actors there. I've yet to find a copy of Phantom the movie, but I hope it's as good as this book, because this book, well, I just love Dean Koontz. I absolutely adore him. And he brings the macabre and the mystery together in such a wonderful way. He's a very interesting gentleman, has led a very interesting life, and it comes out in his writing. This is a very, very well-written book, and a very gripping story it truly is and i am absolutely positive that you will enjoy this and if you manage to get hold of a copy of the film then well done because i haven't been able to find one and goodness me i have looked yeah so it it must be a rare film i don't know but anyway i thoroughly thoroughly recommend this book for you for Halloween. I am absolutely positively sure you are going to love it just as much as I have done. And on that note, my darlings, I will leave you. And uh, if you like what I do, give us a thumbs up. And if you really like what I do, you can always subscribe and follow. And we'll have more adventures like this, won't we, my darlings? Yeah. So happy readings and enjoy. And until tomorrow, take care, my loves, and I'll see you then.